Today on Q&A Mondays, we talk wind uplifts, UL90, and how they relate to real-world applications. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel, and welcome back to another episode on Q&A Mondays. It's a great day here on the channel. I've got Jeff Hawk, Adam Mazzella back with me, and today we're talking about UL90, engineering procedures, wind uplifts, and what all that really means and how it relates to the real world. Um, and these questions kind of stem from our uh, engineering testing video that we did a little while back in Florida. And I think it'd be really helpful if you haven't seen the testing video yet, check that out first. And you can check that out right here. Um, so you can kind of get a baseline and kind of see what these tests actually look like and, and what we're talking about today. Um, we had a bunch of people comment. So shout out to Christian, Polo Mayer, and Joe Patrick for uh, asking about these questions. Adam, why don't you tell me, uh, give me a brief overview of engineering and testing procedures in relation to UL90 first so we kind of get a baseline. Sure. So UL90 as a standalone, uh, when you look at a UL90 or UL90 construction number, isn't technically engineering. But going through a UL580, which is what you do to achieve UL90, that is actual testing, that is engineering. So to go through a UL90 test uh, or a UL580 test to achieve UL90, um, it goes in three phases. Um, you, you ramp the assembly up over 80 minutes per cycle to get to UL30, which is essentially 45 pounds per square foot of positive and negative pressure on the assembly um, over 80 minutes. And then they ramp it up in phases up to UL60, which is going to be 75 pounds per square foot of positive and negative pressure. And then ultimately to achieve UL90, they ramp it up over another 80 minutes to 105 pounds per square foot of positive and negative pressure. Once that is sustained without failure, without any issues, that's how you achieve a UL90. So UL90 is like a level and UL580 is the actual test. Correct, correct. So, so in order to achieve UL90, you have to perform a UL580 test. So guys, how do these numbers translate to practical application? Jeff, can you tell me a little bit about that? As Adam stated, when you do a UL90 test, you achieve a test pressure of 105 PSF. Your design pressure is basically half of that because in metal roofing, you have a safety factor of two. So you have your test pressure of 105 and then you have your uh, design pressure, which is a 52 and a half. And UL90 is basically the minimum industry standard as far as uplifts are concerned when you're installing a metal roof. So with pounds per square foot, how, do, how does pounds per square foot relate to wind uplifts and wind speeds? The pounds per square foot design pressure doesn't necessarily correlate to a wind speed. It's not saying, okay, I have a class 90 rating, so I have a 90 mile an hour wind speed I can meet. Your design pressure goes into correlation with your building design and the exposure categories that you're in. Um, a lot of what's used to figure it out is a program called ASC E7. So they take your roof mean height, your exposure category, the different zones of the roof, A, B, and C, or one, two, and three, depending on how you're looking at them. And they figure out what design pressure you need to meet based on the height of your building, whether it's partially enclosed, fully enclosed, um, the exposure category it's in, whether it's surrounded by buildings, it's on a coast, or if it's, you know, in a field by itself. Um, and they correlate the design pressure, the information about the roof, into what wind speeds you need to meet and compared to what design pressures you have to have. So it's, it's pretty complicated. It's not as cut as dry as this uh, design pressure meets this wind speed for all buildings. Yeah. And then, you know, when you're talking about the zones of a roof, I mean, you know, t think of it like a roof plane being like this piece of paper. You know, you have your field and you have your edges and you have your corners. And it's the same, same way as, you know, theoretically as almost picking up this piece of paper. Try picking this piece, piece of paper up without grabbing an edge. That's your field. When you go pick up, you know, at the edge, it's a little easier. When you go pick up at the corner, it's even easier. So, when they talk about, you know, what your clip spacing is and things like that, how to tighten things up, your higher uplifts are going to be at these edges and, and corner zones. Okay, so the number doesn't translate to one wind speed overall, but it 
is based on location, zones of your roof, and roof height, and some other factors. Yeah, roof roof design. Roof design. Okay. Yeah, and a, a big common misnomer in the industry is that UL ninety means ninety miles per hour, and that's that's not the case whatsoever. So if UL ninety doesn't translate one to one to wind speed, and you know it's it's a complicated thing to talk about. How does a building owner know um, whether a system is going to work in their region? When a contractor or a general contractor apply for a building permit, um, they have to submit the information to the local building department, and it should be verified uh, what the system that they're using meets the local codes for that region. What you have in one area that's sufficient isn't necessarily going to be sufficient in all areas. Areas that, say you have a residential house with a lot of buildings around it, it'll probably need a lower design pressure than say if you have a house in an open field or prairie or something like that because the wind speeds and the, the amount of wind that are able to get to that roof is less in a more uh, huddled area than it is when you're in an open field. So it's all based on you know geographic location, what your surrounding surroundings are and you know the environments that you're in and beyond that i mean roof design factors into it you know the the height of the eave the the slope and and things like that also factor into it as well so there's no clear cut what what wind speed correlates to failure with this type of roof system there's there's just a lot more to it than just you know 150 miles per hour right you know what i mean right. so yep makes sense so to adhere to testing, what does an installer need to do differently? You know, as, as one of my mentors has always told me or always told me it was a metal roof is a metal roof. So, you know, if you take the approach that everything uh, should be engineered, really it's nothing different. So if you're using the appropriate details and the appropriate clip spacing recommended by the manufacturer within their engineering, there shouldn't really be anything different. So some manufacturers may have their clips spaced out a little bit farther, some a little bit tighter. Um, just keep that in mind as an installer. If you are installing a roof, um, it may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer by system. So it might, uh, you know, from a mechanical lock to a snap lock, it may vary. And then additionally from panel width. So even with a tighter panel, um, you know, you might have different clip spacing. So um, one thing to, to kind of keep in mind is don't just assume that if you're using a tighter panel or a more narrow panel than was engineered with that you can space your clips out. Even logically, it may work. There may not be engineering to support or uh, sustain those uh, potentially, um, you know, uh, uplifts that it could be subjected to. Beyond all that, you know, things an installer has to keep in mind or do differently or things that a homeowner should be aware of is that with a tested panel and engineered system, you can't go with a lighter gauge. So if somebody says, hey, I'm going to give you a Sheffield Metals uh inch and a half mechanical lock here's the, all the testing here's all this that and the other but i'll do it in 26 gauge that's not an engineered system any longer so you can go uh you can tighten the clips up and maintain a tested system or maintain our engineering you can go with a narrower panel than what we tested and maintain the engineering you can go with a heavier gauge and maintain our engineering so you can't go wider and maintain the engineering you can't space the clips out and maintain the engineering and you can't go with a lighter gauge than what has been tested that's not to say that your manufacturer hasn't tested that lighter gauge or the wider clip spacing things like that but again those are all things that got to get verified by the contractor before they go and pitch something as an engineered system that may in fact not be one right and as a manufacturer, where can installers get our information as far as uh, engineering and clip spacing and stuff like that? Yeah, all of our engineering is on our website. Um, all of our test reports, you can view it. It's very dry. I, I always tell people if you're looking to fall asleep at night, go take a look at our <laughs> test reports. Um, but we can verify our actual test data. Um, beyond that, the most powerful tool um, I think we have available is ask your local sales rep for our tech stick. Um, our tech stick has our whole gamut of technical information um, top to bottom. So that's a great resource as well. Awesome. And just, just to add on to that, your, your test report is going to dictate every type and every style of accessory that you're going to use in a metal roof system. Um, it's going to dictate the clip. 
this is a proper clip to be used. It's going to dictate the fastener, the length and the type. Um, it's going to dictate the substrate you're attaching to. If you have plywood testing and you're, it's going to be installed over 7 16 OSB board, that testing doesn't light up because there's different pullout values in the different substrates. Um, if your clips are attached with a number 10 fastener and a test report and installers using a number nine or something different, that isn't always going to supersede the fashion that's being used in the test report. So the parts and pieces that are used in the test actually have to match what's being installed on the roof. Uh, thanks for clarifying that, Jeff. You make a lot of, lot of great points. You know, I think beyond that, if there's a question, ask. I mean, that that's one thing that especially, you know, we want to make clear and all metal roof manufacturers should make clear is when it comes to engineering, you know, we want to stand behind the product. So we want it installed accurately, correctly, all correct components, all correct dimensions, you name it. So let's get back to UL90 for a second. If a system does not pass the UL90 level, does that mean it's a bad system? I think most manufacturers and, and people that are doing engineering, that's, that's the minimum that they strive for. Um, <clears throat> It's not saying that if you don't meet UL90, it's necessarily a bad system for your application, as long as, say, UL60 meets the requirements that your building is going to need. Um, if you're building, you know, say, in an area that doesn't require a UL90 rating, then there's, you know, technically no need to over-engineer it. Um, so if you can get by with a UL60 rating, then, you know, it's fine if it's in your area. Um, as Adam said earlier, you know, that's why you want to ask questions before before things are installed and before you go out and get a roof system put on to make sure that your roof system is going to meet the requirements uh, for your building type and your project location. So what's beyond UL90 then? So beyond UL90, it's if you just go and test uh, UL580, essentially you stop uh, once you achieve UL90. Um, but beyond that, you know, you can take it to ultimate failure, which I think the testing video, I think we exposed something to a UL1897. That is, once you achieve UL90, you go beyond that to test UL1897. And that is, you have to achieve UL90 or achieve a UL580 test prior to doing that. You can't just put an assembly in the in the test chamber and crank it up and blow it up. Um, and similarly, you go up in intervals and you have to hold it. And essentially what you're doing is checking the maximum sustained design pressure before you get a kink in the seam, before you get a fastener pull out, before this system fails. Um, and then back to one of Jeff's uh, points earlier. Again, when you do take it to ultimate failure, that's a great indication. But when you go back, you still have a uh, design factor, a safety factor of two that you have to put in there to show, you know, what your system is going to perform with or perform at. So we've talked about UL90, we've talked about UL580. Um, what other testing standards are there out there? there? There's a ton of different test standards out there. Um, there's different ones for uplifts. There's different ones for different types of water penetration and wind-driven rain, submersion, air infiltration, fire, hail. Um, <clears throat> Specifically, what we're talking about now is uplift still, so we'll, we'll stay on that track. Um, so you have UL580 and UL1897 like we've talked about. UL580 is class 30, 60, 90. After you reach that, you go to UL1897, which is ultimate failure. Those are all performed over a solid deck. So those are all performed over plywood, VDEC, VDEC with ISO, OSB, any, any type of solid sheathing. Um, then you have wind uplift for over open framing, Berlin systems. Um, that test is called ASTM E1592. The same idea as far as how the test performed, the test specimen's a little different. It's a little wider, a little longer, because you have to have, you have to be able to span those purlins. So purlins can be anywhere from one foot to five foot is pretty industry standard. Then you have factory mutual, uh, factory mutual I-90, uh, things like that. Factory mutual testing is usually involved when a building is insured by factory mutual and they will require that testing. Uh, you'll see things written in specifications requiring FM approvals. If it's not insured by FM, then technically you can supersede it with uh, UL90 or 1592 testing, depending on which is going to be applicable to the system. Then you have different code approvals. You have things like ICC, International Code Council, uh, Florida Product Approvals, 
TDI, Texas Department of Insurance. Those aren't testing standards. Those are basically certification bodies, usually based on geographic locations that will review your engine, the manufacturer's engineering and certify whether or not it meets the requirements to be listed under their approvals. So, Jeff, you mentioned specs. I've seen UL construction numbers called out before. How is that different from our conversation that we're having right now? Okay, so you have a UL90 rating, and then you have things called UL90 construction numbers. Um, as we've talked about, you know, how a manufacturer achieves a UL90 rating, you go to a third-party independent lab, you do the UL580 test. Uh, the lab is either certified or you have a representative from UL there watching the test to make sure everything's being done per code. Um, and you get an actual test report with how the panel performed with a engineer seal, race seal on a test report that's actually physically given to you. With a UL90 construction number, um, it's, it's basically engineering by rapport or a blanket test that covers multiple different manufacturers panel systems that are that are really, really similar. Um, so say for the engine half mechanical, if you look on a UL90 construction number, there is 20, 30, 40 different manufacturers of an inch and a half mechanical system. And they say that if you install it per the requirements of the UL90 construction number, that all these systems meet UL90. Um, main differences are is you don't actually have a test report with a raised seal from an engineer when you get a UL90 construction number. Again, you're getting basically you engineering by rapport. Um, oftentimes there's things that aren't industry standard in a UL90 construction number that aren't common practices. Uh, some of those things that you'll see are safe to be installed over a plywood deck. Instead of the deck being nailed down, which is pretty industry standard, uh, they'll screw the deck down. Um, you don't see that a lot of times. And another thing with the plywood uh, they'll do is they'll say they'll caulk the butt joints. So anywhere the plywood seams meet, they'll take it, they'll caulk it with urethane sealant. Those aren't standard practices. So um, I, what I feel is that a lot of times when UL90 construction numbers are installed, some of those things are overlooked, you know, as far as caulking joints, screwing decks down, because they aren't common practices in the industry when you're actually installing an overview system. All right, well, thanks, guys. I think we learned a ton. Um, it's really important before your roof is installed, research all of this information that we're talking about. Um, you know, verify that engineering meets the needs of your building, that everything is installed correctly per the engineering reports. And we talked about UL construction numbers and how it's super important to have an actual testing report rather than just a certified UL construction number. And also, you know, there's a clear distinction that when UL 90 does not necessarily relate to one single wind speed, but there's a lot of factors that go into um, how UL 90 directly translates to real world environments. So thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. Comment below if you have any questions. Check us out at Sheffield Metals Online. Subscribe to the Metal Roofing channel, and we'll catch you next time.